anti-corruption discourses in a moralistic tone, in a simplistic tone, have always been in the Brazilian history and in other democracies' history, a powerful weapon to destroy your political opponents in a very cynical and strategic way. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. In the wake of President Lula's re-election, Brazil finds itself at a critical juncture, with numerous questions arising about the relationship between the political, legislative and judicial systems. As Brazil grapples with its political dynamics, it is crucial, I believe, to understand the extent to which the judiciary maintains its autonomy and upholds the rule of law. And that is why in this episode, we dive deep into this crucial aspect, highlighting the challenges and potential implications for the country's democratic fabric. To discuss these issues, I'm joined today by Conrado Hubner Mendes, who is renowned for his expertise in constitutional law. He is a professor of constitutional law at the University of Sao Paulo, and his work encompasses the separation of powers, judicial review, theories of justice and democracy, and the Brazilian Federal Supreme Court. Conrado and I explored the current political situation in Brazil, the intricate relationship between the political and judicial systems, and the arduous task of tackling poverty, inequality, and corruption. We also discussed environmental protection in Latin America, where environmental rights have increasingly been enshrined in domestic constitutions. Why have nations entrenched these rights within their constitutions? And what are the consequences of such entrenchment for the environment? With summer around the corner, we will be taking a short break. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my fabulous guests in season four, which is soon coming to an end. The final episode next Wednesday will feature Francis Fukuyama. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy listening to my recent conversation with Conrado Hubner Mendes. Conrado, it's lovely to see you. Uh, welcome to the show. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. You are here now. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long while as well. So it's a pleasure to be here. Really nice. The first thing I want to ask you is what is the situation in Brazil these days? Because after those turbulent years with Bolsonaro, you finally have a president who the international community at least loves. I don't know what the scene is in Brazil at the moment, but we got this feeling that at least Brazil is moving in the right direction after those turbulent years. What characterizes politics at the moment in Brazil? Well, then there is a sense of back to normality, although this might be an overstatement and this is too early to tell. Of course, we are breathing fresh air. It it, it has come to normality in many levels. Uh, I've been writing weekly columns in, in newspaper and during Bolsonaro's time, I had 55 scandals per week to choose from. And, and it was re- really easy to have a topic topic to talk about. Right now, it's, 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 it's like uh, struggling to find, well, what, what, what should I, I talk about in the, this week? Because this is normal politics to some extent. With lots of challenges, the, the, the country is in a, in a very serious economic crisis. Bolsonarism, so to say, is very present. Uh, it is very present in the National Congress. It has its supporters and, and representatives in the state governments as well. Bolsonaro himself is, is back after a sort of self-exile in, in, in Miami. His return like a month ago, he's facing serious legal accusations, but it's still a very open question how far and how, how courageous the justice system will be 
to actually uh, apply the, the correct sanctions to the massive illegal acts that he practiced, both criminal acts and also all sorts of other law he, he, he broke, and, and, and how far he, he will be actually removed from the political scene. It is important for the survival of, of democracy that the autocrat is contained. And we have the, we, Brazil had this uh, achievement, this huge achievement, which, which was to defeat Bolsonaro under very extraordinary circumstances, in a very difficult elections, in a very rigged election, so to say, to use a Trump's word. Uh, Bolsonaro put too much, too much effort and uh, applied the government itself to elect himself, but we were lucky to have a, a popular leader that has a political capital so so strong, which who, who was able to defeat Bolsonaro. But but I, I see this moment as a window of opportunity to sort of try to contain, even to revert the the, the, the wave of autocratization in Brazil. Bolsonaro is not is not that politically. Bolsonarism is even less that politically so uh, the argument that the re-election is the is the tipping point for the for the autocratization we managed to defeat but in 2026 it will come again and i think this argument will remain strong so it's a it's a it's a long endeavor to to resist and to to protect democracy yeah, it seems that the United States is a couple of years ahead of you in that. So what happens to Trump is going to be pretty interesting for Brazil. But one thing, Conrado, that I've often wondered about, and I'm sure my listeners are also interested in knowing, is the extent to which the judiciary is independent. What is the relationship between the judicial system and the political system? And on the one hand, you had during covid the Bolsonaro camp denying many of the uh, scientific evidence and was questioning this in the courts. I don't know what, what the fate of those lawsuits were. Th there is, I think, this idea among many that Lula was unfairly convicted of corruption or you know, at least some would say. So during his term, how was the situation? And then Bolsonaro came. What was the situation like during Dilma's term? What was the situation like? And what is the situation now? Are they independent or is there a strong nexus between politics and the judiciary? I would say then that Brazilian judicial system remains very independent in the sense of, not in the sense of not being politicized, not in the sense of not having some sort of corrupt practices, corrupt in a, in a, in a deeper sense of uh, mixing private with public, uh, in a deeper sense of really breaking really ordinary, uh, ordinary principles of judicial ethics, in terms of mixing uh, itself with huge economic interests, uh, in, in all of, in, in many ways, the Brazilian judicial system has has been criticized. I've been studying the Brazilian judicial system and especially the Brazilian Supreme Court, and I've been writing about it. Uh, but in there is one way in which Brazil uh, or, or the, the the justice system cannot still be called as as as, as not independent or as captured, which which is the way other democracies in, in process of autocratization have become captured. So Bolsonaro has attacked the justice system and in particular the, the Supreme Court all the time, very aggressively. The justices themselves individually and the court raising suspicion, uh, inciting crimes against it, etc. So uh, it is it is something to be to be told that the, the, the justice system has, has remained independent in the sense of not basically uh, becoming an ally of, of Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro has not managed to reform the justice system. This is a particular step that other autocrats have done. Uh, the, the, the paradigm for it is, is what happened in, in Poland and in, in Hungary. So not, nothing similar to that had happened in the first tenure of Bolsonaro. Uh, it was definitely 
in their plans. But uh, despite everything Bolsonaro has done, uh, the Brazilian justice system uh, was not during this period. And, and autocratization processes are, are gradual. They are incremental. They are step yeah. by step. During this period, uh, uh, the, the Congress itself was was not uh, also supporting that idea. So in, in some, uh, it was possible for the justice system and for, for the Supreme Court to take decisions that were contrary to Bolsonaro's government interest. There is an argument that the, the Brazilian Supreme Court resisted Bolsonaro, was one of the main uh, bulwarks of, of resistance. And this argument sometimes it gets exaggerated because the court has its political capital and political capital is, 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 is always some sort of limited. Uh, the, court also, also, the court also failed to resist in many, many of the Bolsonaro's government uh, measures against democracy uh, and against legality and, and so on. And the court can be criticized for not having resisted enough but this is not a measure of not being independent. This is a measure of uh, a phenomenon that also always happened in the separation of powers dynamics. Courts measure how much it can do, how much, how much it, can, it can go further. And I, I, I criticize the court for, for not having done enough. Uh, apart from the Supreme Court that I've been mentioning, the Brazilian Electoral Court has done an amazing job and that has that that should be should be said during the election in 2022. If there was a target which all the time was being uh, fired or uh, being attacked uh, during not not only the the electoral process but in the years before, because as you know, autocrats question the elections. Even when they they win, they they allege fraud. They said, well, th there was fraud, but I managed to win. Yeah, and the Brazilian electoral system has a very a very successful and sophisticated uh, uh, system of electronic ballots which which managed to basically uh, uh, it, it made fraud electoral fraud disappear from Brazilian elections basically Brazil Brazil has a, a, a huge history of electoral fraud but from from the 19s onwards the the, the allegations of fraud were all the time they were refused. They, 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 we have never had a, a sort of consistent uh, finding on, on, on fraud. And, and this system resisted despite really, really strong attacks and suspicions alleged by Bolsonaro together with the armed forces. So there was a, a, a permanent harassment, institutional harassment of the electoral court. And this is the case of actually an, an amazing resistance of the judicial system. That's fascinating because I'm thinking a little bit about some of the work I did uh, many years ago in India, looking at uh, judicial review, looking at public interest litigation. And one of the things I realized then, looking at the literature, but also in interviews with people, was that there was this phenomenal trust, you know, in the uh, Indian um, judiciary, but it was mainly related to the Supreme Court. It was at the highest levels that the judiciary was trusted. The lower courts, people were very frustrated because they were being harassed, you know, on unfounded, baseless allegations. There was this huge backlog of cases that were piling up. So, you know, justice was being denied, delayed. You had 40-year-old cases, you know, still ongoing. So the Supreme Court was seen to be the protector. It was this kind of an elite level, but not everything was being resolved there. So I'm wondering then, what is the public perception in Brazil about the credibility? So one thing is, of course, the independence, but also the credibility. Is it at all levels or is it only at the highest levels that the court enjoys trust and credibility? I, I, I guess something similar can be said about Brazilian courts in relation to what you said about Indian courts, because the Brazilian judicial system is composed by, of course, an elite class of professional lawyers, which becomes more and more elitist when you go up 
the the scales or the hierarchy of the judicial system so the we we have a a process of entry by a public exam and this system provides at the base at the basis of the first instance judiciary a quite and, and, and it's a very, very limited way but a, but a quite plural sort of judges that get into the career in terms of gender mainly in terms of gender in terms in social economic terms and in racial terms still very limited but still there is some sort of judicial creativity judicial progressiveness in the first instance it's not mainstream but it exists when you go to the second instance and the the process of progression in the career select a lot in terms of ideology conservative ideology and also elitist patrimonialistic ways of of going up uh, the the hierarchy in terms of credibility it it oscillates uh, the, the judicial system in general has a has 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 benefited from some level of credibility and and, and legitimacy and especially in the last 10 years when it embarked in a sort of crusade against corruption yeah the Supreme Court and the first instance of the car wash operation was the, was the biggest judicial anti-corruption operation in the world. And it has become famous all over, all over the world. People were talking about it and admiring what was happening. Rich people, the economic agents and those, those companies that, that have always practiced corruption were not up to that point being sanctioned and, and 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 so car wash was celebrated at that very moment and of course the the country itself was was entering to a crisis and this unfair coincidence made people think that the crisis was due to corruption so the justice system was sort of in a messianic way tackling the, the 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 main cause of the of the of the crisis supposedly in the end after 10 years taking stock of that experience it was quite tragic because the way the judiciary tried to embark into a into a institutional messianic cause instead of actually being serious to legality has shown to be to to, to have affected Brazilian economy, and mainly it has produced Bolsonaro. It has cleaned the political system and created a sort of culture of anti, anti politics, of reducing politics to corruption in a very moralistic sort of discourse, in a very criminal way, uh, reducing the anti corruption policy to criminal cases, individualizing the main, the main culprits or the main responsible for, for, for corruption to, to particular persons, uh, losing sight of the structural conditions and structural causes that affect corruption and, and, and that stimulate corruption. So it was very tragic the way we tried to, to attack corruption. But I'm, I'm mentioning this because, of course, the popularity of the, the judicial system for a while has raised a lot in terms of well, finally our heroes are here trying to well the main the main characters of of this operation have become politician judge moro has become nothing less than bolsonaro's minister this was a big scandal the the man who helped correctly or not correctly respecting law or violating law but the fact is he helped electing bolsonaro and a month later he becomes bolsonaro's bolsonaro's minister which is problematic in many ways to start with the fact that, well, the, the sense of impartiality that he had to, to play was basically lost credibility. So I, I, I'm, I'm going in, in many directions. But what, what I would say is that the Brazilian judicial system is very responsible for many human rights violations. It is responsible for mass incarceration. It is responsible for a very conservative sort of interpretation of constitutional rights and etc. Sometimes there are impro important uh, rights cases from the Supreme Court. So sometimes there is a top down an, an enlightening decision coming from the Supreme Court protecting uh, liberal rights. 
and this is this is more or less a very homogeneous culturally, ideologically, and politically judicial system from the elite. Still independent. Still, it, it, it has a corporatist attitude that protects itself. It, it it knows how to protect itself politically, even when it it enters into into questionable practices. It is a very well paid career, and it gets well paid and and all the time gets higher salaries through quite questionable practices. And through these, these, these means, it manages to remain independent from politics, not independent from corrupt interest necessarily, not independent to protect rights, for example. So my, my description was a bit unsystematic, but I, I, I said many things that I think it's, they're important. I think you describe it very well because I think it could apply to many societies. There's so many contradictions. Yes. It's never like a yes and no yes. answer, right? And I then again, going back to the Indian case, I think there is that contradiction that I don't trust the lower courts, but I trust the highest court, yes. even though a lot of people would say that despite progressive verdicts, nothing much perhaps changes. You know, the, the courts can come up with very progressive verdicts, but if they're bypassed by the political leadership, if they're selectively implemented, or just the, the verdicts are just put in a drawer somewhere, what is really the evidence and how, how important is it? And every day you hear about, you know, and I've had guests on my show talking about culture wars in Brazil, the role of the church, religion, marriage. There are all of these very um, burning issues, very controversial issues that affect us all. And we are constantly grappling with, I suppose, how we view the judicial system. And I think one important aspect has to do with predictability, knowing that I'll get my fair chance to prove myself innocent or whatever. Just knowing that I stand a chance rather than mm -hmm. feeling, you know, there's no chance at all. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, Conrado, the extent to which you think the Lula case, the corruption case against him, that resulted in people perhaps becoming a bit more disillusioned than normal. Because here you had for many years this optimism. And I remember teaching in Rio talking to a lot of your students at the Federal University of Rio, at the Catholic University, talking about Brazil's place in the world. Mm -hmm. Things were looking up. Brazil was becoming this global power. And at least outside Brazil, there was a very positive attitude. But I was surprised when I was in Brazil, people said, hey, come on, we're not that. We're not becoming as great as you guys think. It, you know. So the, the, the perception within Brazil was very different from the perception I had yeah. outside Brazil. And then things turned around quickly with change of power and, and corruption scandals, etc. And then there was this perception created, correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe this is victimization of, of one individual. And and so that, that's what I'm sort of wondering. And then, of course, uh, Bolsonaro comes and it just becomes even more chaotic. Mm -hmm. So so do you think Lula's um, case was a turning point in any way or was it just a continuation of of what you think was happening in any case? I, I think that, well, anti-corruption discourses in a moralistic tone, in a simplistic tone, have always been in the Brazilian history and in other democracies' history, a powerful weapon to destroy your political opponents in a very cynical and strategic way. This is a general trend of Brazilian history. The anti-corruption discourse was present in the military coup in 64, for example. There is always an anti-corruption discourse behind authoritarian measures. And I think that in the end, we can say to some extent that the car wash operation is part of that story. This is not to say that the car wash operation, which was a huge thing in terms of, of illuminating corrupt practices between state and state companies. Especially Petrobras. And... Especially Petrobras and especially the, the huge companies of civil construction, which have huge contracts with the state. That sort of corruption, which Lula has not invented, actually, basically, basically, it was created by the military regime itself 
these huge companies, Brazilian companies, which have become international and practicing corruption all over Latin America and Africa, for example, like Odebrecht, they have become huge during the military regime. And in, during these 35 years of Brazilian democracy, since 88, the year of Brazilian constitution, they have been basically corrupting the public, corrupting public authorities all the time. So this is, this is one thing. This is very structural to the Brazilian political system, to the way the executive power managed to establish relations with the legislative power and so on. So the car wash operation illuminated those things. At the same time, to take the, the, the most important bit of the car wash operation, which is the criminal lawsuit against Lula himself, that was very fragile in terms of the evidence it's it brought up. That was very fragile. It, it has become legally fragile for the authoritarian and illegal procedural attitudes it took against Lula. It has become legally fragile because of the public strategies of uh, manipulating public opinion and leaking conversations, in, intercepted conversations, and so on. So what, what, what we can say is that this that, that there was a backlash against car wash. And in this backlash, in a, in, a, in a sort of legal backlash, there is a sense in, there is a wrong tendency to say that Lava Jato or the car wash operation can be reduced to a political case and that corruption does not exist, was not demonstrated. Corruption was demonstrated in many levels. And despite the wrong, the, 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 the very politically wrong acts and, and illegal acts of some of the main actors of car wash operation, the prosecutors and the judge, and even from the Supreme Court justices, despite they having manipulated law, one cannot say that Lava Jato has not shown corruption. And so this, this backlash, which tries to hide uh, everything, is also problematic. That, that there, there is a problem in both attitudes. First, in what we call the car washism or Lava Jatism, this movement of manipulating law and applying lawfare against corruption, breaking the law, by breaking the law and by choosing your, 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 your targets, politically choosing your, choosing your targets. There, there, there's a lot of evidence on how much Lula himself and Lula's party was the main target of the operation when the party itself is, is, is just one, of, one more participant in, in, in those schemes. So there was a lot of problem, but, but there is also a problem in, in, in the way we are refusing to debate what Lava Jato has shown. So the, 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 this, is, this is a very, a very complicated moment for Brazil because the backlash against everything and 100% of what Lava Jato has shown uh, reduces our legal debate to this polarized legal situation. On the one hand, there is this uh, fighters for the rule of law. So we resisted Lava Jato and Lava Jato basically was pure simulation. This is the side that defends Lula himself. On the other side, the anti-corruption cause, to some extent, had lost credibility, completely lost credibility. So in the next couple of weeks, Lula is about to nominate the next Supreme Court judge, for example. And instead of the public sphere debating what the post potential candidates for, for this position Think about law, about constitutional law, about fundamental rights, about separation of powers, about environment. Instead of debating those really striking questions, we are basically debating whether he's for or against car wash. When car wash is just a detail on, on, on what the Supreme Court is supposed to do, in a way, there are very perverse effects on both sides that Lava Jato has created. Lava Jato itself was a huge mistake and a huge opportunity which was lost by unable uh, legal actors. On the other side, those who actually not only fighted against Lava Jato, but actually were, were practicing law as lawyers and, and earning lots of money defending those who were charged with, with criminal accusations, they basically are erasing the debate about corruption. And, and, and in, in such polarized situations, is. It, it, it becomes very difficult to criticize both sides. For one side, you are part of the other and vice versa.
if, if I criticize those who struggled against Lavajato, I am necessarily a Lavajatist, a, a supporter of Lavajato. So, yeah. Conrado, let's move on to something that I know interests us both, and which is the environment and this unique, some would say, uh, cases of Latin American environmental constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. I was actually looking at some of the latest newspaper reports about President Lula, and he's been making all the right noises. He's just secured, I think, $100 million for the Amazon fund from the UK. And he has, in many ways, put Brazil back on track in, in terms of, you know, protecting the forest, combating deforestation, because one of the many, I mean, you mentioned earlier, there were so many scandals during Bolsonaro's uh, rule. One of the many scandals that actually resonated a lot abroad was what is happening to the Amazon, you know, unrestricted access to mega projects, infrastructure building, cutting down trees, etc. And I noticed early on when uh, President Rula was reelected, there were some concerns that his environmental agenda would again, you know, be somehow sidetracked because of railway projects, because of, you know, these huge infrastructure projects that were aimed to, to promote development in many parts of this huge country of yours. And related to our previous discussion, looking at the, the role of the courts, I enjoyed reading a piece you wrote, uh, was it last year, looking at how different countries in Latin America have addressed these concerns. And I remember actually a few years ago, was it in Ecuador, I think, there was so much attention, right, on that formulation, the constitutional provision, giving nature a right, which was seen to be quite drastic, quite unique. So give us a little overview of how you see the courts playing a role in climate change issues in Latin America and more specifically Brazil. To what extent do you think one can count on the court to combat unrestricted use or over-exploitation of natural resources, which Latin America is very well known for a lot of extractive industries there. Yes, of course, this, this remain, remains very much an open question. And the signs that we have been seeing in the last couple of years do not allow too much optimism. So just, just to give a, a, a very, very basic overview of the, what you call this environmental constitutionalism, very progressive constitutionalism in, in parts of the continent itself. It is very true that constitutional texts in Latin America have adopted the most advanced and most original formulations in terms of environmental and nature protection. It, it cannot, of course, be generalized to, to, to all of the continent, but, but it, 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 it is in Latin America that some of those most progressive provisions have come. If, if you look to the so-called Andean or the new Latin America constitutionalism, I'm mentioning Ecuador, Bolivia, and even Venezuela, and, and also Colombia, and, 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 and Brazil is, is part of this story, although it has not written such advanced provisions, but it, it, it already talks about future generations, it already talks about the necessity of, of protecting the environment and have, have a sustainable environment. So, in terms of constitutional texts, it is very advanced. In terms of legal practice, in terms of public policies, in terms of the capacity of the state to implement progressive environmental policies, then it becomes a much more complicated story. And the Amazon forests have been the target of many extractivists. These are extractivist countries. These are countries that have been colonized in terms of extractivism. And huge foreign companies come here to explore the forests, the oil, the minings, and etc. Coming back to the question of how much courts can address it, environmental litigation in, in, in Brazil, and, and then, and then I'll, I'll talk more about Brazil, and I don't feel comfortable to talk about other countries because it's a very rich story, but the environmental litigation in Brazil is huge because environmental regulation in Brazil is also quite quite strict and advanced. And courts have been, have been able to some extent, or as far as legislation is progressive, to apply this legislation. Although some of the problematic projects that have been 
created. And, and, and this can be told, for example, to Lula's and after that Dilma's government, to constructing a huge dam in the middle of the, the Amazon forest, which destroyed local communities and created all sorts of social problems and environmental problems. Law was not able to contain it. And the, the story of the, the legal story of this project is a very authoritarian one. And I'm talking about Dilma's government violated indigenous rights. It, and, and it was done, of course, the story cannot be reduced to that, but it was done to a very large extent to attain companies' interests, to, to attain private interests as well. Even in technical terms, the test dam was not very well uh, justified. The, the dam is, is called Belo Monte. So when it comes to a very powerful economic interest, it is very hard for the legal system and for the state to resist. The state gets captured and, and there are authoritarian measure, measures in the judiciary to, to avoid protective measures. This is in the sense of, of general environmental litigation. In terms of climate litigation, Brazil has entered this international trend of bringing climate policies to courts, which is happening in many countries in the world. And, and, and Brazil has entered a, just a couple of years ago with a very structural lawsuit that was brought to the Supreme Court. This is a lawsuit that basically is asking, the, 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 the legal request is a very simple one, is asking the Brazilian state to be more strict and to apply the existing legislation in terms of protecting the Amazon against deforestation. It's a case of uncompliance, of non-compliance of the state with legislation, which creates a, a policy to protect the forest. Because, it, of course, it has implications. The, the main Brazilian contribution to, to climate protection relates to the Amazon. This huge yep. carbon uh, sink. Thing, carbon sink yeah. It's for the whole world. Yes. It's, it's not just Brazil. That, that yes. is the narrative. Yes. These the Amazon is very central for the global climate system. But so far, the court, which has a lot of discretion, this is a particularity of Brazilian court, it has a lot of discretion on deciding when to decide. This case has already four, five years and no concrete decision has been taken. It was brought during Bolsonaro's government and we do not need to say that Bolsonaro's government was tragic in terms of the environment. The Amazon is part of the three core policies of Bolsonaro's uh, mindset. So the, the action was brought during Bolsonaro's government and after Bolsonaro was defeated, there is a sense and a commitment, an open commitment of the new government to protect the environment. So it is an open question again, how far this lawsuit will go, especially when a new government, which is committed to the protect the environment, it has a very important environmental leader as a minister of the environment. So the, the, the conclusion is, I'm very skeptic about the, the role that courts can play. Of course, the, it can play additional roles apart from basically deciding and facing uh, the public authorities. It, it, it plays symbolic roles, it plays discursive roles, it helps catalyze mobilization, and, and, and this is important. But in terms of being strong enough to decide and order the state to control the environment, the court cannot do that alone. You know, I think that is where it is interesting when one reads about this enormously positive, of course, focus on nature rights, on environment, climate issues in the Constitution. I suppose one has to be a bit cautious that, mm -hmm. and, and this perhaps is my beef with you lawyers, I often feel that there is quite a lot of emphasis on the text, the legal document, just mm -hmm. getting it in the Constitution is a fight, obviously, that civil society often campaigns for. But then a lot of it gets lost. This is also with human rights legislation. You know, I, I'm interested in how these very progressive sentences or provisions are actually operationalized. How can you hold people to account for failing to abide by those rules? And 
I suppose we can't expect the judicial system to do everything. Obviously, you could use public interest litigation to petition the courts so that even though you, you don't have a, a basic interest, the standing requirement is waived. I've studied this in terms of the right to food in India. You know, you have people questioning the, the government. Why are people dying of starvation when there's so much food available? So you have these powerful movements mm -hmm. which force the judiciary to come up with very progressive legislation. The judicial system comes up with these verdicts and then what happens is highly determined by how NGOs and others follow this up. Mm -hmm. Because the new story breaks and it only lasts for a few days. You're dependent on somebody else in society to keep petitioning the courts to say, has there been a follow up? Would you say that in terms of, I mean, if we were to be a bit more optimistic, yes. just getting some of these provisions in many of these constitutions in Latin America is a victory, wouldn't you say? I think it's a victory. To the extent that people are not uh, naive to, to, to think that the victory is the, 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 this small victory, and it has to be recognized. The fight is over. Yeah. The fight is <laughs> over. And actually, the fight has, has only begun to, to that particular constitutional provision, which the, the, the effects of which are unpredictable. They need to, 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 to get roots into the political culture. It needs to inspire good political leadership. And to some extent, leaders have to actually be committed to it. So I, I fully agree that this is a victory. But sometimes is a, it can also become a Trojan horse. It demobilizes sometimes. The, the, the only fact that it has provision, it, it, it basically made people think that the fight is over. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right to the point. So the courts are too weak to do such a huge thing. And what I said about Brazil applies to other countries as well. Ecuador, which has this such a beautiful constitutional provision, exactly. has been facing really problematic projects of infrastructural projects financed by huge international money. And the government have not been able to contain it. And, and, and this is a crude environmental violation. So these expressions sometimes get a life of their own and, 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 and manage to get into the political culture. But this has not yet been the fact here. Uh, these projects are sold by a strong argument of political or, or actually economic development, tackling poverty, facing inequality. These are problematic countries. So how can we use a, an environmental argument when the argument on the other side is to combat poverty? Th th these are hard struggles. I was thinking also that is exactly my my position on this is that we have seen all over the world in many parts of the world impressive social movements mm -hmm. arising because of a common cause whether it is health or food inequalities or corruption and achieving impressive progress and then stopping once that victory once that provision once that verdict has been given one just stops and then Mm -hmm. It loses steam in many ways. So I think we, we have to keep petitioning the courts all the time. A final set of issues. You have a personal uh, stake in all of this. You've written a book, was it almost a decade ago, on uh, deliberation, on the importance of debating, free speech, a deliberative democracy is very much in the news. Uh -huh. And in this context, as academics, we are also often subject to all kinds of pressures. Yes. And one type of pressure is the one that is aimed at curtailing our academic freedom. Yes, And I'm told that you, of course, are still facing a lawsuit, which is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that experience and how this has turned you into perhaps, a, 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 it's given you a lot of attention Yes. Um, in not just in Latin America, but also in other parts of the world. So, so what is the state of that lawsuit against you? Well, I was sued by in, in 2021, mid 2021, by first by the Attorney General, basically for having written an op-ed piece in a Brazilian newspaper where I'm a weekly columnist. This Attorney General has been recognized, openly recognized by all by, by, by all Brazilian society as a sort of ally of Bolsonaro. So the attorney general who, was, who has the legal 
responsibility to control the legality of what the presidents do, he has become an open partner of Bolsonaro. And I criticized that attitude in, in more technical terms. I demonstrated his omission and in a, in a very, to some extent, in a very strong language. And I was, weeks later, I was sued. I, I, I'm facing a criminal lawsuit for defamation. And, and, and again, weeks later, for the same reason, basically for the same reason, but now from Supreme Court justice, the first nominated by Bolsonaro, I also criticize the sort of commitment to Bolsonarist causes and a very political, monocratic decision that he took alone in the middle of the pandemic. I criticized him in, a, in an open piece, and I also faced a criminal lawsuit. These cases have become, both cases have become paradigm cases debated all over the country. I received a, a huge wave of solidarity from academics, from civil society, from international academics, from the political system as well. This has been openly recognized as absurd, as a violation of academic freedom. And academic freedom in general during Bolsonaro's time have been facing lots of troubles. I'm, I'm not the only person to have faced these sort of, of problems. And fortunately, the situation gets a lot better now. But it, this is part of the toolkit of every autocrat. And, these, and both criminal lawsuits are still pending in this very inertia way. How do you deal with everyday life, this constant harassment? It's hanging over you all the time, right? This, this uncertainty. Yes, yes, this is true. Although I'm, I'm, I consider myself to be privileged, to be a lawyer myself, to be a member of, the, of, a, of, of a prestigious law faculty, to not have to spend money with lawyers. I am, I, I have, uh, the, the newspaper is paying the lawyers for me. So I know very well what's happening. It's, it would be different to be a biologist or a climate scientist and to face a legal action. I, I wouldn't understand that the, the sort of fear that emerges from that sort of attitude would, would be much uh, more difficult. And biologists and, 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 and doctors and, and climate science also have faced that in Brazil. So I myself, as a lawyer, feel a bit safer. And, and the case is so absurd. <laughs> the case is so absurd that I cannot imagine that this will result in some sort of punishment. And I understand what they are doing. They are doing intimidation. The victory for them is to silence me. It's not the final verdict. So I have been studying academic freedom even before my lawsuit. So to some extent, this is less hard, so to say, for me because I understand well what is happening. But of course, it is, it is in some particular moments, it is hard. Uh, every time there is a new development in the case, I have to remember to sit with my lawyers and to think it's a lot of emotional costs and time costs with it. But that's, that's fine. I think, I think this, is, this will, 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 will end in the near future, I hope. All I can say is stay strong, brother, and I, I hope you win the fight. I'm sure you will. And let's put a positive twist on this. Maybe a new book will come out yeah. of this case itself. Yeah. 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 yeah, It was great fun to see you, Conrado, to chat with you today. Thanks so much for coming on my show. Dan, it was a pleasure. And I'm, I have become a listener of your show. It was an honor to be here. I was happy to be invited. So until next time. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.